Ok, so we're online. <laughs> Hola, bienvenidos a todos y todas a este seminario ahora virtual, esta vez uh, del Instituto de Ecología. Y es mi gran, gran placer de introducir al, al ponente Chris Cooney de la Universidad de Sheffield. Él es un investigador independiente uh, en, la, en esa universidad. Inició su carrera como estudiante de doctorado en la Universidad de Oxford donde trabajó con la doctora Natalie Seddon y Joseph Tobias, ambos muy conocidos y, y trabajan con aves y, y diversificación, que han hecho trabajos muy bonitos. Y luego, al, tras completar su doctorado en 2015, se mudó a Sheffield con un uh, postdoc con el doctor Gavin Thomas, que tuvimos el placer de tenerle aquí en, en una charla hace unos años. Y en 2019 obtuvo un uh, Liverhome Early Career Fellowship, que es un, un, uh, un contrato muy, muy prestigioso. Y en 2021 obtuvo un contrato de cinco años del NERC, que es la, el, el equivalente del CONACYT, digamos, en, en Inglaterra, y para ser investigador independiente y fundar su propio grupo de trabajo en la Universidad de Sheffield. Entonces, Chris tiene intereses muy amplios en macroevolución y macroecología y hoy nos va a platicar en, de su trabajo sobre la diversificación de las aves. So, Chris, uh, it is a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you for accepting this seminar uh, in a Friday evening, que es viernes por la tarde para allá, uh, para Chris. Uh, and so, uh, prolonging your work week a little bit and um, The floor is all yours, and, and thank you very much for accepting the invitation. No, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a, it really is a pleasure to be here, and I apologize for not um, being able to give the presentation in Spanish. So uh, please bear with my English. Um, so yeah, um, as I say, it's really an, an honor to be invited to talk to you today. Uh, so as Alejandro said, I am a cur currently a research fellow at Sheffield. Uh, and today I'd like to tell you about um, some work I've been doing using comparative approaches to try and understand more about the process driving diversification in birds. And so just as by way of introduction, I just thought I'd tell you a bit about my interest. So I'm really interested and fascinated in this question of how diversity is generated, as I'm sure many of us are. And that's because they're anywhere between five and a hundred million species on earth and given that all of this life is descended from a single common ancestor it's really astonishing to me to consider how life how diverse life actually is and so unpicking the processes and the factors responsible for generating this wonderful diversity to me remains one of the greatest uh, challenges in biology And so I also find it fascinating to try and understand not only why diversity accumulates, but also where on earth it accumulates. For instance, by studying geographical patterns of richness and diversity across different regions of the globe. And so these are, to me, these are fundamental evolutionary and ecological questions. And one way to approach them is to use information on uh, extant living species and the evolutionary re relationships connecting them to, to make inferences about the processes that shape modern day patterns of biodiversity. And the goal really is to develop a general understanding of the importance of different factors and traits in shaping diversity at broad scales. And so for me, I study these questions by focusing on birds, and I think they're an amazing lens through which to examine these questions. There's over 10,000 extant species. We have really good morphological, ecological, and behavioral data for many species. There are expert geographic range maps illustrating their distribution, and we have uh, fairly well resolved species level uh, phylogeny for the group. And so today I just like to present some work to you that's really focused around this aim of trying to understand how and why organisms diversify. Uh, so first I'd like to tell you about some work looking at the diversification of bill shape. 
the second part I'd like to tell you about the evolution of um, some uh, plumage coloration. And finally, uh, I'd like to finish by briefly telling you about some work trying to connect, connect patterns of trait evolution to patterns of speciation. And so a lot of the work I've, I'll talk about today was done in collaboration with a colleague here at Sheffield called Gavin Thomas, and it was made possible by funding from the uh, European Research Council. So first, uh, as I say, I'd like to tell you about work that concerns the diversification of bill shape across birds. And so when thinking about drivers of phenotypic evolution and particularly ecological traits, a common framework that's used to understand these patterns is the adaptive radiation model. And the major features of this model are sort of encapsulated by this figure, showing what paleontologist G.G. Simpson called uh, the eco-space model of adaptive radiation. And what it shows is initially explosive evolution driven by natural selection into new areas of ecological space. And this sort of rapid pattern of divergence here was termed by Simpson quantum evolution. And quantum evolution is a component of this theory that's proposed to explain the rapid emergence of higher taxonomic groups and novel phenotypes in the fossil record. And so, therefore, a kind of basic prediction of this model is a path, pattern of rapid ecolo ecological differentiation early in the diversification process, followed by a slowdown in evolutionary rate as the unoccupied niches become filled and new species pack into ever more densely occupied ecological niche space. Oops. And so, Actually, the role of adaptive radiations as the source of uh, much of the world's biodiversity has been widely em emphasized. And studies of quite localized radiations, such as uh, Caribbean anolis lizards, uh, appear to follow closely this pattern predicted by the adaptive radiation model. However, most of these examples, for instance, anolis lizards or um, Galapagos finches, for instance, have unfolded in unusual, relatively unusual ecological settings and geographical setting, settings, such as island archipelagos. And it's actually, it was actually quite unclear what, to what extent microevolutionary processes such as ad adaptation, divergence and speciation actually scale up to explain the expansion of phenotypic diversity over much longer evolutionary timescales. And so we were interested in addressing this, this question. Um, and as I mentioned, birds are a really great group of organisms to work with to do this, not only because, as I say, we have good uh, phylogenetic data for many extant species, but also birds are, are almost unique in possessing a highly adaptable eco-morphological trait, the, the bill, uh, that's really tightly linked to species ecological, their dietary and foraging niches, and that can actually be compared meaningfully across virtually all bird species. And so in order to compare uh, diversity in, in bill shape, we first need to measure it. And one approach to measuring bill, bill shape is to use caliper or standard linear measurements of length, width and depth of the bill. And while this can be informative, it actually can miss a lot of detailed shape information. For instance, uh, the, the sort of very particular shape of the, the bill of the spoon bill here. And so we took for this project an alternative approach and we used um, a, a high resolution 3D scanner to generate uh, 3D models of bird bill shape from museum specimens uh, for thousands of species. And some examples of these, these 3D scans are shown here. And you can see that the, these scans really do capture the kind of 3D uh, diversity in bill shape across birds. And so to, to convert this 3D information into shape data, we, we placed morphologically homologous landmarks on the, the uh, 3D scans using a bespoke crowdsourcing website uh, shown here called Mark My Bird. And we use this, these landmark positions to quantify bill shape 
uh, diversity in morphological space or morphospace here by performing Procrustes alignment and principal component analysis. And the first, the first two axes of this morphospace are shown here with colors corresponding to the density of species in different parts of the morphospace. And so using this, these shape data and what's called a variable rate model of, of phylogenetic trait evolution, we were then able to estimate rates of bill shape evolution across the phylogenetic tree of birds. And so this figure here shows this distribution of rate variation across the phylogeny. And there's a lot of information here, but the first point to note is that we found actually huge variation in the rate of bill shape change between lineages. For instance, in some lineages, uh, bill shape is evolving over 500 times faster than in other lineages. And actually some of the fastest rates are occurring in well-known adaptive radiations such as Darwin's finches, and they're shown uh, here on the uh, phylogeny. And the second main point is that we actually found several cases of uh, very high rates of phenotypic evolution in Bill phenotype at the in the ancestral lineages leading to many distinctive bird orders. And some of these bird orders um, showing these high uh, rate ancestral branches were things like ducks, hummingbirds, flamingos, um, procellariforms, so tube noses, and actually these, these ancestral high rate uh, divergence events are in line with Simpson's predictions for quantum evolution. So in other words, his prediction of rapid evolutionary shifts into new areas of uh, phenotypic and ecological space early in the history of irradiation. And so from these, these data, we're actually able to estimate how diversity and bill shape accumulated over the the history of birds, the history of extant birds anyway. And we found that this very interesting pattern here shown in black uh, of what looks like um, early rapid accumulation of new bill shapes. And this is then followed by a, a second stage shown here involving a relative slowdown in the rate of bill shape uh, innovation. Uh, and we can show that this sort of this saturating pattern here is very different to what you would expect if bill shape diversity was accumulating uh, naturally or neutrally, sorry, through time. And this is shown in these sort of uh, dashed lines here. And so just to just to break this down a little bit. So in the first stage of the history of modern birds, we found that bill diversity seemed to accumulate relatively rapidly. And as I say, this is consistent with this idea of evolution between broad adaptive zones. Uh, and a really good example of this within the data that we had was uh, the divergence between uh, swifts shown here and hummingbirds, which are uh, sister, group, sister groups to one another in the tree but each has diverged to become very, very specialized and very different to each other in order to extract, in order to exploit a very different resource type. However, in the, the second latter stage of, of bird diversification, we find that bill shapes or new bill shapes accumulated far more slowly. And this is consistent with the idea of evolution within rather than between adaptive zones. And so this is actually observable in our data as radiations within uh, particular areas of morphospace, um, shown here for some examples. So this is uh, corvoid birds, this is um, Phanaridae oven birds, and down here are parrots. And you can see that uh, each group is sort of uh, evolving within a relatively restricted part of morphospace. And so overall, actually, this data support the, support the pattern that appears to be consistent with predictions based on Simpson's model of adaptive radiation. And actually, overall, it kind of identifies um, ecological opportunity and niche avail availability as a really important driver of, of an, at least initial early bird diversification over these really long, broad evolutionary timeframes and spatial scales.
So now I'd like to um, change focus and tell you a, a bit more about some more recent work I've been doing on the evolution of plumage coloration. And as I say, this is, this is much, what much of my kind of current and ongoing work is, is focused on. And so if, for me, I, I, I'm, as we're all hopefully all aware, there's kind of within birds, there's a spectacular diversity of, of color in, and plumage coloration. And I really like this quote from Alfred Russell Wallace, which, in which he said, there's probably no one quality of natural objects from which we derive so much pure and intellectual enjoyment as from their colors. And maybe some people will disagree, for, but for me personally, I, I couldn't agree with this, this quote more. And a really, and a, actually a general long-standing goal has been to understand the processes that both promote and constrain uh, color diversity and actually diversity in, in other signaling traits like, for instance, bird song or, or chemical signaling more generally. And one of the reasons I think working on, on coloration is so fascinating and also so challenging is because uh, communication traits like coloration function in a really di diverse set of processes, including, for instance, mate choice, species recognition, territory defense and predator avoidance. And therefore, the, their actual form can evolve in response to a variety of interacting selection pressures. And so I think in outline, we know what these factors are, and I've tried to kind of summarize them here. The relative importance of these different factors for shaping the evolution of, of communication traits like coloration, I think is generally not well known. And so, uh, recently we've, and also during my fellowship, we've been trying to explore the way in which such traits such as coloration evolve and to try and identify the factors that are important in shaping their evolution. And to do this, we've been working at the Natural History Museum in the UK uh, to collect a really comprehensive um, data set of plumage coloration for the world's birds. And this is based on um, calibrated ultraviolet and visible light uh, phot uh, digital photographs of museum specimens and examples of these, these photographs that we take are shown here. And from this, this uh, calibrated image data, we're then able to extract really detailed information on uh, the color of birds and pattern the patterning of birds for many thousands of species. Whoops. Uh, yeah, and one of the questions I'm I'm really interested in trying to to address is to use comparative approaches to understand the processes driving the evolution of plumage coloration. And so, um, a, a relatively small scale study, actually from a few years ago now, try it, we tried to address this question uh, in a subset of birds called the Tyranida. And so I'm sure hopefully some of you are familiar with these birds. These are uh, Katinga's mannequins, tyrant flycatchers and their allies. And so using information from these museum specimens, uh, in particular uh, data drawn from 10 body regions, such as the coverts and the flight feathers and the crown and the breast, for instance, we were able to measure and, and characterize rates of plumage color evolution for both males and females across this radiation of birds. And again, these, these phylogeny plots show a kind of a complex pattern of rate speed ups and slowdowns across lineages. And in this case, separately for, for female color and for male color. And if you sort of uh, try and take a general view of the, the these kind of re this variation here, we find that actually we see generally higher rates of color evolution in, in Katingas and mannequins. And this is particularly the case for, for male coloration as opposed to female coloration. And, and actually we're interested in understanding if whether we could, would it, if we, we could explain this variation. And so we examined several variables designed to assess the relative importance of different sources of selection driving color evolution, so shown here. And actually one really strong, significant driver that we identified was uh, a variable 
uh, measuring sexual dichromatism of species. And, and so uh, measures of sexual dichromatism or sex differences in color between species is, is a widely used proxy for the intensity of sexual selection in birds. And we found that actually this variable showed a relatively strong positive correlation with the rate of, of male color evolution shown here in the blue line. But actually, we found no evidence of a relationship between dichromatism and rate of female color evolution. So in other words, we found that the males of highly di dimorphic species tend to evolve much more rapidly in coloration than those uh, of uh, monomorphic species. And interestingly, we also found that, that actually rapid color evolution in this group was actually biased towards areas of color space that's, that's dominated by what are called carotenoid-based colors. And so avian carotenoid signals, so the, these types of highly saturated uh, red and yellow colors and orange colors shown here, represent classic examples of sexually selected uh, and potentially condition dependent signals of individual quality. And I think our results here in which we found kind of very rapid rates of evolution towards these carotenoid based colors are consistent with the idea that species might be rapidly evolving these types of signals in response to increased sexual selection. Uh, possibly because sexual selection favors the evolution of these particular colors, or actually because um, the, the sort of developmental and genetic uh, underlying basis of these color um, phenotypes is actually more readily evolvable than, for instance, other types of coloration, such as structural coloration. And so at this point, I just wanted to step back a little bit and say, actually, these efforts to collect a, a, a sort of a very large global scale coloration data set for the world's birds is, is actually still ongoing project. And it's involved like a significant amount of effort from many different people, including research assistants and PhD students and, and even citizen science volunteers. But one um, really rate limiting step that we found has actually been, once, even once we've collected the images of these birds, was actually annotating them in, in a sensible way to try and extract the color information that are contained within them. And so we've tried various approaches to doing this. And, and I should say that we have over two and a half, uh, over 250,000 images of these birds by now. And so we've had to turn to um, machine learning approaches in order to try and try and help us access the data that's stored in these images, these images. And actually a real breakthrough has occurred or occurred uh, in the last few years because of some really great work by a PhD student called Yi Chen He uh, in our lab over here, who built a deep learning framework to automatically, automatically identify the bird in these images, to extract the, the pixels from the image, and also to locate key body regions on the specimen in order to help us extract relevant information. And so if anybody's, I won't go into the details of the method here, but if anybody's interested in, in the details, we have a paper that's, that came out recently that explains exactly how this works. And we, we use the kind of resulting data that this approach gave us in order to investigate um, the, the, the patterns and predictors of UV coloration across passerine birds. Um, but for now, I'd just like to, to tell you about some, some other recent work that, that's also been facilitated by this, this deep learning approach. Um, and that involves studying this question of whether there are latitudinal gradients in, in bird colorfulness. And and for me, this is this is a very intriguing question because so far we've we've been able to really accurately quantify coloration for large groups and species, and therefore actually studying really large scale global uh, patterns of of organismal color has been actually quite difficult to do. And so therefore, we have some some fairly kind of simple macroecological patterns that remain really kind of poorly known. And 
one of these ideas that really interested me is this idea of whether, as I say, there are latitudinal gradients in colorfulness. And this is derived from this kind of common and long-standing belief that, that life in the tropical regions uh, is perhaps more colorful than, than life that lives outside of the tropical regions. And this is kind of exemplified, at least from my perspective, by these quite common illustrations of tropical scenes as very rich and colorful places. And actually this idea is present in the, the very early writings of European naturalists who were fortunate enough to be able to travel from their temperate homelands to the tropics. And then they told tales of the kind of the patterns that they came across as they traveled. And there's a very nice one from Alexander von Humboldt in which he, he essentially spells out many kind of different types of latitudinal gradient here where he says the nearer we approach the tropics the greater the increase in the variety of structure grace of form mixtures of colors and also in the perpetual youth and vigor of organic life and so just to very simply state this the implication is that color colorfulness or color diversity peaks in the tropics and declines towards the temperate and the polar regions. And for me, this is, this is as I say, such a well-ingrained and, and actually very simple idea. I was surprised to kind of realize that this pattern's not been, not been definitively demonstrated, and that's because of the reasons I kind of, I mentioned earlier. And in fact, there are, there are v several reasons why we might expect life in the tropics to be more colorful than in the temperate regions. Um, and generally, these explanations fall broadly into three categories, focusing on uh, latitudinal gradients in climatic conditions, um, the traits of species that exist at different latitudinal bands, and also uh, the, the relative strength of biotic interactions in the species-rich tropics versus the, the relatively species-poor uh, species temperate zones. And so, Again, we address this question in passerines and just a brief word on passerines. So passerines are songbirds. They represent 60% of, of bird diversity. That's almost or over 6,000 species. They're globally distributed. They have extensive variation in coloration between species and also colorfulness between species. And they're very ecologically and behaviorally diverse, which, which affords us the power to, to address some of possibly the underlying the causes of uh, variation in phenotypic differences. And so as I mentioned, based on Yu Chen's uh, automated image segmentation approach, we developed a, a pipeline, a workflow to, to take these images, seg automatically segment them, extract um, calibrated color measurements from each uh, specimen and then we mapped this into avian visual color space and used this variation in color to quantify a metric of colorfulness for each species and we were able to do this for uh, over four and a half thousand species which represents 75 percent of passerine diversity and so just just to give you some idea here we for instance, we have two species here, the black crown pitter on the left and Mrs. Gold sunbird on the right. And once we kind of take our images and apply the workflow, we're able to generate these measurements of the color diversity of each of these species in a, what's called avian tetrahedral color space. And examples of these, these data are shown here. And then we use this to calculate a metric of color diversity or colorfulness. And so oh, before, before then, once, once we've done this process for those, those many thousands of species, we're able to, to produce um, a plot of data like this, which essentially shows that the range of different plumage colors that are exhibited by passerine birds. And so this, this data point, the, the, the amount of data in here is, is on the order of kind of 50 million different data points. And so, yeah, as I say, on a, on a per species basis, uh, we're able to generate metrics of, of colorfulness using this data. And we use two simple metrics, which essentially quantify the, the spread or diversity of points within color space. And therefore here we're defining uh, 
colorfulness on a per species basis so actually on a, it's actually defined as within individual color diversity and this provides as i say a per species measure of colorfulness and that we can actually do this separately for each sex within each species and so to visualize the spatial pattern of variation in in species colorfulness we we mapped species values and calculated uh, average colorfulness scores for each grid cell uh, across across the distribution of passerines and we actually found quite a striking latitudinal trend in color diversity that does indeed seem to peak in the tropical regions and the pattern is shown here for for color uh, colorfulness of male plumage and actually, I just before I move on, I just wanted to point out that there's been there's been several previous attempts to test this idea, but actually most of those tests have focused on specific areas of the globe or specific regions. For instance, several of them focused within Australia or, for instance, in in North America. And actually, you can see that when you when you zoom in on e each of these regions individually, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of a latitudinal gradient. But when you zoom out and you you consider the, the the globe as a whole only then does the pattern become uh, obvious so really this is a truly global scale pattern and so this is the the pattern for male colorfulness we found a similar gradient in female colorfulness and arguably the the latitudinal gradient in female color colorfulness is 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 indeed stronger than it is for for male color And so to, to formally test the relationship between latitude and, and colorfulness, we calculated colorfulness scores for different ecoregions in order to not do this on a grid cell scale to minimize autocorrelation. And we used kind of methods to test the relationship here. And we found in each case that there was a significant effect of latitude on both male and female coloration corresponding to the expected pattern of, of kind of steep declines in colorfulness uh, as you move away from the tropical regions. And so this is kind of summarized in, a, in if you just simply kind of extract a sample of colors for equatorial birds versus high latitude birds. And you can kind of see very clearly from this plot that the, the diversity of colors represented by or present in tropical birds is simply Kind of much greater than the diversity of colors represented in high latitude birds and this is this is corrected for kind of differences in the number of species in those different regions and so just briefly before i move on i just wanted to stay say that uh back here in the in the uk uh, this this finding this paper attracted some media attention but rather in focusing on the kind of the the main point of the paper the media attention focused on the fact that or the interpretation was that basically this paper was claiming that British birds are boring. And so, I mean, that's a very UK centric view of these results. And actually I'd rather focus on the kind of the pattern that, that actually we have these incredibly colorful, diverse places on earth that we should be more interested in. And so, as I say, we, we're interested also in explaining potentially why this, this pattern this global pattern occurs and as I mentioned it can generally be hypotheses can generally be resol resolved into three different categories of explanation and so we assembled various data for different variables that relating to these categories and tested whether they they were significantly correlated with species colorfulness values and importantly the majority of these these variables were actually correlated with latitude implying that they, they represent viable explanations for the latitudinal gradient. And actually the only, the only exceptions to this were, were body mass and dichromatism, which across species are unrelated to latitude. And actually we found significant effects of both of those variables. So we found that smaller species tended to be more colorful than larger species. And again, we found um, a significant effect of, of dichromatism on colorfulness in males, but not females. But as I say, the, these can't explain the latitudinal gradient because these variables aren't correlated with latitude. However, we found, in addition to these effects, we actually found 
important effects of lots of other variables. And I won't go through each of these now, but just to say that we found positive correlations between factors related to each of these three different classes of hypotheses, indicating that potentially the, the kind of explanation for, for these latitudinal gradients in, in bird colorfulness is a combination of, of lots of different lots of different mechanisms. And while this is kind of this is the first step in trying to understand these these mechanisms. And as I say, we, we need to do much more work to actually understand the, the mechanisms that are, are generating these relationships between colorfulness and these, these sort of very coarse uh, general predictors. And so very briefly, just to finish, I also wanted to very briefly touch on this question of whether actually the, the kind of rates of trait evolution that I began talking about are actually coupled to rates of speciation uh, at phylogenetic scales. And so the reason for doing this, I think, is because trying to understand if, how, and why these two, these two rates are related can actually provide really big insights into the forces generating diversity and, gen and, and producing evolutionary radiations. So for instance, I mentioned adaptive radiations have been emphasized. Uh, and actually a key component of this theory is this coupling between um, ecological differentiation and, and speciation. And so if that's the case, then we would expect a positive relationship between rates of trait evolution and speciation rate across lineages. On the other hand, there's, there's actually growing evidence for, for the, the prevalence of what's called non-adaptive radiation. And that this is when speciation appears to occur in the absence of strong divergent ecological selection and possibly driven by things like um, the formation of geographic barriers between species or divergence in, in mating preferences, for instance. And if these sort of non-adaptive radiation processes predominate, then we might expect different relationships between these traits, such as no relationship if there's a mix of processes, or actually negative relationships if, if non-adaptive non or non-ecological mechanisms dominate. And so there are various ways to test these ideas, but perhaps the most straightforward way is to look for correlations between rates of speciation and trait evolution using phylogenies and comparative methods. So that's the approach we decided to take in this instance. And to do this, we, we followed other studies and we used, in this case, body size as a proxy for morphological evolution in, in this group, in birds. And we estimated using some of the methods that I've talked about already, uh, per lineage rates of speciation and also rates of body size evolution um, using these flexible models of trait evolution. And relating these two sets of rates together and running um, some, some statistical tests based on simulating data sets null data sets, we found that actually there's a relatively weak um, but significant positive relationship between rates of speciation and body size evolution across birds. Um, so in other words, there's, there's a tendency for fast speciation to be associated with fast body size evolution across lineages. So then we were able to actually expand this approach out to other vertebrate radiations with good data on body size and phylogeny. And, and actually, when we ran the same tests for these other vertebrate groups, we found in each case similar positive relationships between body size and species, body size evolution and speciation. And actually, uh, in comparison to the other groups, birds actually showed the weakest relationship between speciation rate and body size evolution and squamate reptiles, in contrast, showed a much stronger relationship between these two rates. But one thing that's probably fairly obvious to everybody here is that there's a huge amount of, of variation or scatter around these general relationships. And so we, we were interested in trying to understand this a little bit more. 
And so when we broke down these radiations into their constituent subclades and we ran the same types of tests, we actually found considerable variation in the relationship between these two rates within these subclades. For instance, we found that some radiations uh, mirror the overarching relationships, uh, the positive relationships we found. Um, and actually, some of the strongest evidence for these positive relationships is, is in groups that have already been identified as having strong relationships between size evolution and speciation. And this is for groups such as cichlid fish, um, bats in mammals, and also uh, the woodpecker group in birds. And so in contrast to this, we actually identified just two groups where we actually found strong negative relationships between speciation rate and body size evolution. And to me, this is really, really interesting because it's completely opposite to the pattern that's expected from adaptive radiation theory, and that seems to dominate when you, when you would assess these relationships at broad phylogenetic scales. And it actually suggests that in these two groups in particular, rapid speciation has occurred potentially by non-ecological or non-adaptive mechanisms. And, and unfortunately, we haven't yet managed to dig, really dig into these results to figure out what's driving these relationships. But it's actually possible in these kind of high rate groups with, that are lacking morphological differentiation that other factors are driving speciation in these groups, such as geographical isolation, or as I mentioned, um, possibly kind of divergence in mating signals. And finally, though, I just wanted to say that actually we, within groups, we found in most cases, we found no evidence of a positive relationship between these rates. And so while this kind of lack of effect could re represent um, power issues, it could be a signal that actually a significant amount of diversity within these groups acc accumulates via non-adaptive mechanisms, or at least mechanisms that are unrelated to differentiation in body size. And so um, just to finish, I think that given that we find um, I think it's really interesting that we find this pattern of diversity and disparity accumulation being correlated at broad scales, but much weaker signals at, at smaller phylogenetic scales, because I think it really emphasizes this idea that over much over very long time frames, ecological flexibility and, and differentiation promotes the accumulation of species richness. But despite this, this kind of overarching relationship, significant amounts of diversity can accumulate via non-ecological and non-adaptive mechanisms. And therefore, to, to truly and generally understand the drivers of diversification, we need to integrate all of these different factors and these different mechanisms to really understand their influence and their, their ability to explain variation in patterns of diversity and differentiation. And so with that, I apologize if I've gone on a bit too long. I just say thank you very much. For